The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Good afternoon. <laughs> um, so first of all, Denise helped me by earlier in her lecture where she introduced the, um, the pre-scramble to Africa um, by just using the, the term anyway, helped me in the sense that mine is sort of right after the scramble I'm going to be talking about. And um, what I've chosen to do is actually present three vignettes. Um, they're not case studies because I think a case study would be something more analytical. But um, three vignettes to sort of look at three different examples of things that happened um, in the 20th century in Africa, three, three very different things. The first one uh, being an example of colonialism, um, the Italians um, uh, in Asmara in Eritrea. Um, and the second one is a kind of, uh, it's actually not really um, a, a specific place. It's not really Algiers. That's a kind of code word for Le Corbusier and what follows, meaning um, Siam and Team 10 and things like that. And it's really, if the first one was about um, exerting something over a place, the second one is more about it, the experiments that began with Le Corbusier, but then evolved into something, I think, that became much more specific to the, the place, meaning the, 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 what, they, what, what his colleagues and his students learned about Africa and what, what followed that. And then the third one um, is um, something from within, something that developed from within. So if the first one was from without, the second one was more experimenting and eventually having a connection with within. The third one is something that evolved from within. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about how um, when I first discovered or started to look at Tuba, it was to me something inconceivable. I had no idea that something like this existed. But as I went further into it, I realized that I knew more about it than I than I, than I thought. So anyway, as I promised, I'll go quickly. So we'll go from east to west, first um, to Asmara, then to the mythical Algiers and other parts of Africa, and then also, and then later over to, to Somalia, to, to, to Tuba. This is, a, I was trying to debate which one would wor work the best, so this is, this is the second map. Um, I thought it would be important to start with just a map showing the colonies and, and where the Europeans had uh, sort of occupied themselves, the Italians in this upper area um, uh, near the Red Sea, um, and moving along to a map of its location, Atria's location in Africa, and then um, Atria and Asmara. Um, this is the landscape that one would pass through going from the sea towards, um, towards Asmara. Um, Asmara is two kilometers above sea level um, inland. Um, and when the Italians first um, uh, occupied the, the coast, um, they found that the, the, the weather was not satisfactory to their, to their liking, so they moved further inward and um, found Asmara to be good. Also, there was fertile soil there, and the rainfall was good. So it was first thought of as, as the possibility of creating a agricultural, a self-sufficient agricultural um, land. Um, and this is the city it became. Um, that of that evolved, of course. Um, that that the, the 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 reason that it, that that the Italians looked towards that was partially because of of the this idea that Europe was moving towards uh, occupying Africa, but also because um, the 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 um, Italians were having a, a crisis at home in terms of populations moving to the city, overpopulation in the cities, and and trying to find a way to sort of solve some of those. So the idea was to create these, again, self-sufficient agricultural communities where um, some of that, that strain could be taken on. Um, but it began, um, it began, this is a map from 1895, um, and it shows the early settlement of Asmara by the Italians. And primarily, a lot of these other uh, indications on the map are, in fact, smaller villages that were already there. It began by uh, one um, a military fort, fort that was built, um, Campo Cintato, which was built in the sort of center of the of the the um, this area that's shown on the map, 
Um, and um, I just wanted to note on this one also this trade route. This is a, a caravan route that goes from the sea inland and connects to um, and connects to more inland towns and villages. Partly because of the fact that um, it, you know it shows that Atria was already on some kind of a, a, a communication network, but at the same time it also um, it had a part to play in some of the overlays that happened in terms of the Italian plans. So here's the the, the first real urban plan. This was when um, the, the city went from a sort of little military encampment to um, a more urban, uh, or towards a more urban um, development. Um, this is 1913, um, and uh, it was done by an Italian uh, uh, civil engineer. And you can see the, the, the sort of core of the city. Some of this was built, and then the extensions um, on, on, on either side of that, that core. And then also you can no notice in certain places the villages of Indigeni, which is the places for the inhabitants. Um, and in the next couple of slides, we'll get into this sort of issue of, um, of um, uh, segregation. Um, actually, this is the one. Um, this is a, a few years later, 19, 1916. It shows a plan um, of Asmara. That, that trade route somehow passes in sort of this way, I think, at this point. Um, but basically, the areas that aren't delineated are the areas for the indigenous, the, the areas where um, the, the, the Asmarians would stay. Um, and then the, the, this, this darker sort of orange color was the area where the Atrians that had some, uh, the Asmarians that had some relationship with the Italians, meaning through commerce or some other activities, um, could, could enter that zone, but they, the, anyone that didn't have uh, that permission was not allowed in the zone. And then down below that, you have the further development of, um, of Italian, both urban uh, uh, pieces as well as um, uh, more re residential sort of um, villa-like um, um, neighborhoods or quarters. And this is a, a, an image of really what the majority of this part of the city was like. It was, and, and to this day still is, which we can talk about at the end. Um, some of the first early significant buildings. Um, these two buildings I just show to give an example of um, the Italians, uh, the sort of eclectic nature of Italian architecture that, that, that first happened there and continued to happen actually um, up until the 30s. Um, this was the, the, the sort of political seat. And this is a, a typical street uh, scene, a street front that you might find um, in Asmara around the early 1900s. Um, which is pretty reminiscent of what you might find in Sicily or in other, par par other parts of southern Italy. The, the theater, which is from uh, about 1919, 1920, um, was a kind of significant uh, um, in in inclusion into the, the fabric of the city as, in the sense that it, was, it created a venue where art and the artistic aspects of, um, of, of the Italian population started to to, to, to engage in. In other words, some kind of art world started to evolve so that the Italians felt somehow more like they were in, at home. And this is a, an image from somewhere in the 1930s that show um, these zones. So you can see up at this top one in the north, this is the indigenous zone. Um, the, the, these uh, sort of angled blocks were the, the industrial zones, and then you can see the city being formed here. Later we'll come to the market and some other parts. This is that zone that I talked about earlier, which is primarily a more of a villa zone. Um, in the few books that exist on this, I, I'd, I'd, I'd rather speculate that they're not totally right on, on this. They, they try to sort of connect every type of uh, 20th century Italian architecture to something that was happening in Asmara, and um, and so they talk about this as are these these works. I mean, this is a, a building in Italy. This is a, what one might call a futurist building. Um, all of you remember the lecture on futurism, of course, in Marinetti and 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 San Elia. So I'm not going to get into that right now. But um, um, th th this is an example of an Asmarian building, uh, two Asmarian build, uh, three Asmarian buildings that are being uh, sort of talked about as being futuristic. Um, in this one, which I think this, uh, even though I know um, how much you've heard today about uh, globalism, I'd just like to tell an anecdotal story about this one because I think it's kind of funny. Um, this building has 
been described as this sort of futuristic building because of its wings and its sort of the idea of flight, as well as this one being sort of more like a locomotive, which is I think the reason why there's a juxtaposition of those images. But the story goes is that the engineer who actually designed the cantilever, which I think is, 50, if I remember correctly, is 15 meters, stood on top of the cantilever with a gun. And the two, there's two stories. I guess one is a pessimistic, and one is, one is positive, and one is negative. The the and I, you can choose which one you think is which. Um, he was he, he was, one story says that if it collapsed, he was going to shoot himself as it was collapsing, and the other one was that he needed the gun because he couldn't get anyone to pull the scaffolding out from underneath because no one believed that it would stand. But it's still there today, so it's kind of interesting. Anyway, um, I don't know what that says. Sorry. Sorry about that. Don't ask me again. No. Okay. Um, so again, this connection between what was happening in Italy and 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 the the architecture that was evolving in that plan that we saw earlier. Um, this is uh, Muzio's Cabruta, which is uh, probably the most famous example of Novecento architecture. Um, and Milan was a. This is in Milan, and this was a, a real, um, a, a real. This is the, the, the most potent example of, of, um, of Novicento. And um, I always see Novicento as this kind of architecture which you can find in almost every part of Europe, which is this sort of struggle between neoclassicism and modernism and some, some desire to hold on to some, some of the qualities that, that, um, that mod, uh, some, to try to imbue the building with some of the qualities that modernism is propounding or proposing, but, but trying to hold on to some of the past. And um, obviously the, the name um, came from the local, the locals and their attitude about it. This is a building that um, I have a little movie about, but and I, I, I know, I know. I'll, I promise I'll try to get to it quickly. But this is a building. This is uh, Cinema Roma, which is also of uh, Novecento. So now I have to do Alt Tab. Oops, Alt Tab. Oh, here we go. So you'll see it like this. I think this 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 is a, a interesting clip because it talks about the cinema, but it also talks about this issue of segregation that I talked about earlier. Video removed due to copyright restrictions. Okay. Um, at the same time, um, uh, it, or shortly after in Italy, um, uh, modernism had taken seat, and the the term rationalismo or rationalism. Um, started to take hold. This is uh, Giuseppe Tirani's um, Casa del Fascio in Como. This is the it in its site. Um, I think this is one of the early drawings of it. Um, and um, one of his most famous buildings. This is also Tirani in Como, um, the Novo Comum. There's a, a kind of very close parallel to this building that was happened that was built um, some years later, obviously in Asmara. But the, it seemed like that Asmara was this kind of um, blank canvas that allowed, or the safe zone, I, I should say, w that allowed uh, Italian architects to experiment with things that were, which, which was far more complex in the, the urban uh, setting of, of Italy. Um, and there's some more examples of, of architecture that falls into that category of rationalism. Video removed due to copyright restrictions. So this is, this is um, Palazzo Falletta. Um, in the courtyard that you just saw in the plan, very reminiscent of some of the rationalist buildings that you'd find in um, in, in mainland Italy at the time, and there are, there are hundreds and hundreds of these. Um, in some of the literature that I looked at, they said that there were more modern buildings in Asmara than any other city, and they compared it to places like Tel Aviv, um, which we all know have abundance of of, of modernist architecture. Um, so. Um, while all of this was happening, um, Italy was changing as well. Um, in 1922, the, the, um, the fascist, fascist party took over and um, Mussolini had uh, different designs on Asmara. Uh, rather than it just being this sort of um, colonial outpost, he, had, he saw it as a sort of gateway for his movement into, uh, into Ethiopia and other parts of, of Africa. So um, the city expanded drastically, 50,000 people uh, within a few years. So the, the city got quite large. So these are just some images of, of the development of the city at that time, including, you can't make this out very well, but it's a scaffolding with Benito's face uh, projected on it. 
And then uh, sort of one of the last uh, stories in, in Asmara. Um, this is a plan from 1938, obviously, again, during the, 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 the fascist period. Um, and it has also a little story that's kind of interesting. The idea was to have a competition. And um, the, at some point, this was, this was uh, or, organized by the, the fascist party, but at some point the, the, the governor or the mayor, I, I mean, of Asmara decided that he would take um, control of this competition and, and organize the panel of judges. And um, it turned out he actually won. Um, he, he made a submission and won. Um, which which created quite a scandal, and so he was at, he was booted out of office, and um, the, the plan was was denied. And so um, from from uh, from from uh, Rome, um, Mussolini sent an architect to work on uh, a new master plan, which included. I mean, it's obviously a much more extensive plan than some of the ones you saw earlier. But these areas up here are the indigenous areas, so at least they're at least being shown as somehow a um, uh, on, on the plan is not just being a sort of nobula or something, but they're actually shown as some kind of housing. Um, and this is a, 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 some, a little statement about uh, the scheme, and which makes it quite different from the, the earlier plans that we saw. Um, it was, it, um, the scheme utilized a unique mixed quarter, meaning a place in the center, a buffer zone, uh, and he called it a diaphragm. Uh, between the strictly Italian district and the indigenous areas. And that was this marketplace that was proposed, which actually um, began construction in 38 and didn't, it wasn't completed until 52. So it was in st a stage of construction for quite a long time. Um, but there is somewhere buried in there, I think a quote of his, um, all of the quotes don't show up, um, which talks about the fact that the whites would only come in, in contact with the indigenous people of, of, a, of a higher category because they would be involved in commerce or in, in trade. So this, this is, was his scheme of trying to sort of lessen the, 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 the uh, racial aspect of, of the plan. Anyway, these are just some images of um, contemporary Asmara. And just one last building. Um, because it's a rather unusual one and actually sets the stage a, a little bit for some of the things that happen in the next um, um, vignette. Um, this is a, a, an Orthodox church. Um, it actually was built on the site of this, on this one, on the side. Um, it's built on the site of uh, a, 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 an Orthodox church that had been there before, before the Italians arrived, that was moved by the Italians um, and then rebuilt. Um, and it's one of the few examples of a, of, a, of a work of architecture done by an Italian who uh, was actually trying to somehow understand something about the indigenous architecture. So you can see um, these agodo. This is a traditional dwelling of this area, and this kind of thatched roof um, was used um, on top of the, the building. And also in the, in the, the way that the coursings were, were worked out, um, between concrete and stone, there was uh, some semblance to a technique that was used uh, often, which you'll see in this another example of a building, which, which was built by an Italian architect. Uh, no, actually not by an Italian. Yeah, by an Italian architect uh, earlier. Um, and this is called a mon monkey head design, where in fact within the the stonework there are there are uh, there are usually juniper logs that are placed in as ties between the coursings, um, and. Um, and so anyway, the idea is that, that, that within this kind of coursing, it's at least had some kind of semblance to, the, to this, um, this historic um, uh, tectonic or building type. So that's, that's vignette number one. It's again, it's, it's meant to sort of spark your interest in, 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 in Asmara. I think the, 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 if, if, the, if the discussion would, be, would continue on Asmara, it would be interesting to talk about um, how the the, uh, the Asmarians have taken over the city and how it's become a, 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 a city, the, their city. Um, in fact, they were the ones that built it. So, the next the next vignette is kind of funny uh, because, as I said earlier, it was labeled as Algiers, and it's not really Algiers. Although you will see Le Corbusier's work, which you're all probably fairly familiar with in Algiers, but it really has a little bit, to, a lot more to do with certain acts of experimentation that went on in Africa that began with, with Le Corbusier's ideas, which were sort of one-sided and utopic, but then uh, sort of spread out into, I think, much more investig investigatory kind of um, um, endeavors by a number of different architects. And the, the big surprise for me in, in, in doing this research was discovering 
Ernst May, who all of you remember from lectures on the, the, his work, actually we'll back up or go forward a little bit, his work in, in Frankfurt, um, and also this project, which I think was um, one of the projects that he was in the process of working on uh, around the time that the fascists, I mean the, the, the Nazis took control, which, uh, which uh, basically made it impossible for him to return to Germany. I don't understand completely what, how he made his way to Africa, but he stayed in Africa from 1934 to 1953, and he, his, the, his activity there was pretty significant. So I'm, this is a sort of introduction to this part, but I just want to show it to you quickly. He worked in Tanzania, he worked in Kenya, he worked in Uganda, and I'll show you some of the projects that he worked on. And if you remember the Siedlung in Frankfurt, which, uh, which is exactly, the, just to go back to this, this image is exactly the reason why, why Siam II happened in Frankfurt. It was because of the Siedlung. So all of these people descended on Frankfurt because primarily of the work that Ernst May had made there. And then, you know, just some few years later, he was, he was in Africa. Um, so anyway, this is just to give you some examples of that work. This is one of the first projects that he worked on when he arrived there, part, partly because it was something that he worked on for himself, but it was also something that he, worked, he was constantly looking at prototypical projects, which we'll see over and over again in some of the other architects' works in Africa. And this was for a farmstead um, in Tanzania uh, in, from 1935, and it was using concrete, a concrete frame system, which was something that hadn't been used at all in that, in, in that area prior. Here's a building that he did um, just a few years later in Nairobi. Um, and you, know, you, can, you can see all kinds of references to, I don't know, Mendelssohn and other people, but some, somehow, the, uh, and also there's some interesting structural work that's been done in this building, but somehow I read that there was, his, there was some thinking that went on in this building that had to do with the fact that the streets were, were dirt and he wanted to develop some kind of mechanism. So where, whereas you have Briselet in buildings that you'll see soon that are working with the light, that somehow th this building was working with the dust and the movement of dust uh, from the streets and tr trying to keep it from actually making its way into the building. Whether that worked or not, I'm not sure. Another example of some of the things that, that Ernst May was working on, um, this is a, um, a, a prototype of a, a construction. I don't know if you can see it well from there, but it was a concrete construction of a hook slab system that, that uh, would, would um, create this kind of almost Qantas hut type uh, architecture. Um, and he also worked on the expansion of uh, Kampala in Uganda, uh, the capital. Uh, and the, but, but the expansion was using, um, again, prototypical housing designs that were based on similar kind of themes. This was another study he did in 1947, which made, it's a comparative analysis where you can see, and it was looking at buildings on slope sites and how, how prototypical buildings could be designed to work on slope sites because uh, he was working on lots of slope sites. Um, and so he has African examples, he has Asian examples, and he has uh, somewhere in there American or US examples. And so he's making a comparative analysis between these buildings. Um, and then a couple sort of fairly significant works. These are both done for the Aga Khan. Um, uh, one was a school in Kenya. Both, they're both in, in Kisuma uh, in Kenya, one, both, both around, the, around 1950. This is a, a, a early childhood education center and a clinic. And um, so you can still see the, the, even though he was experimenting with lots of sort of traditional architectural forms, there's still um, an allegiance to some of the earlier ideas of modernism that he had, had been working with in, in, um, in, in Frankfurt and Berlin. And one last image of his. Um, I had to show this because it was to me so somehow quite amazing to discover, you know, we all know Bruno Taut went to Japan, we all know Gropius came to Boston, we all know that Mies went to, 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 um, to Chicago, but I'm not, I, don't know, I don't think many of us have ever talked about the fact or, or thought about where he went. So these are uh, uh, one last image of him from a, 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 a British newspaper talking about him not having been uh, to England since 1927 and visiting all of the, these projects that um, some of the, the next colleagues that we'll talk about had been building, like the Smithsons and people like that. So this is where we talk, go to Algiers. Um, and you all remember these because we've talked about Siam and the whole idea of what Siam was and how um, little by little it became co-opted by Le Corbusier, um, which you remember from reading your global book. Um, and then also about uh, around, I think this was Siam, I think 
forget which one, 1948 Siam 7, I guess, with this whole idea of the grid, this way of presenting material, presenting um, architectural ideas uh, in a very systematic way. And I show you this only because of the, the methodology that's used in this has to do with the, those standard uh, zoning terms, uh, which I, I can't read right now, but you know, housing, uh, uh, move, uh, communicating, um, working, and, um, and recreating. So those four very simple kind of ideas that Le Corbusier was interested in. This is just an image of, of the sort of systems that were happening. Although these next, this next group of people were dealing with colonies in, in, in uh, Africa, they, I wouldn't put them in the same category as, as what, what went on in Asmara. They were, they were, there was much more experimentation. And in fact, much of, many of these projects were for the inhabitants as opposed to what we saw earlier. So here's Algiers in a postcard. And some projects by Le Corbusier, of course, just to sort of build it off because uh, that would legitimize my using the word Algiers. Um, but this is a project that one of the first projects he did in 1933 to 34, um, when he was asked to do a subdivision sub for you know, many houses where, of course, he didn't do that. He created this one enormous block for 300 inhabitants with all of the services in one connected to a highway, which later comes back in some of the other works. Also, this is a project that I hadn't looked at closely, but I found rather interesting um, when I did study it. Um, this had to do, again, with the sort of topography dropping down to the sea. Um, and you know, obviously, there's the Brisolet and, and other issues that have to do with sunlight, which probably have similar conditions only um, on the opposite side of the Mediterranean in, in France, where he was used to dealing with. But this idea of creating this open space uh, at, the, at the ground level um, not so much for uh, trying to lift the building off the ground like in the five points, but to create a view corridor so that people moving along the boulevard would never lose sight of the, of the, the coast and the ocean, um, which I found kind of interesting and, and strange. Um, here's one of the largest projects. He, he was relentless in terms of trying to push these projects through. Um, and this one uh, was, a, was a project for a skyscraper, which he uh, he described as being unlike the, the accidental American form of skyscraper and being more from a biological kind of nature, which is something he made allusions to all the time that his architecture had you know, this sort of organic biological component so that these, these functional elements of play and work and all of that were you know, sort of almost like circulation systems and things like that, um, which we'll, we'll look at quickly again after. Here's another example of the skyscraper with its brisolet and, and, and multi-functions that are happening. And this is at the, at the marina in Algiers. And then the last project, uh, or the last built or proposed built project of his was this huge uh, project, which probably you're familiar with, but um, this whole idea of linking the, 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 the harbor uh, part of, of Algiers with a, a, some existing um, um, residential quarters that had, you know, were already there by creating this sort of highway architecture, this, this sort of building that, 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 that also had the, the highway above it, um, as you can see down here. Um, he, he, he obviously was not a person that gave up easily. Um, in 1950, he published this book, uh, The Poet, uh, Poesie sur Alger, and, and in it, he was just reiterating again and again the same kind of concepts. So you can see you know, these idea of view corridors and sun, and here's the tree and the organic quality of his, of his skyscraper. Um, and also, I, although I won't get into details, you know, the whole idea that you know, they, were, they, they desperately needed his, his ideas. At the same time, other members of, of, of Siam were doing other things, but also in, on the African front. This is a, a book from 1947 that was Jane Drew and Maxwell Fry, who were both early members of Siam. Um, some of you know this book, I think, probably very well now. But it's a qu quite interesting book on, at, at sort of evaluating and trying to understand the indigenous uh, culture there and trying to somehow solve its problems. So in some ways, it may not be so far off from the Corbusier, but it evolved. Um, they did study um, both rural and urban architecture. And eventually, as you know from looking in your global book, that they did eventually made some significant architecture um, in Nigeria, the university. Um, 
but in, uh, in 1956, they also co-authored co another book, which became a real um, significant book for many reasons. Uh, one, because it became a kind of handbook about how to make architecture in places like uh, our Africa and South America and other tropical zones. Um, and it was broken down into issues that were far different than those kind of issues that Kubusi had been thinking about in his sort of narrow framed um, grid. Um, uh, and this is this is a, one, this is the cover image from the book, and I think the quote's kind of beautiful from thinking of the time. Architecture in the humid uh, tropics is a collaboration with nature to establish a new order which human beings may live in harmony with their surroundings, whatever that may mean. Um, I think that book had quite a significant impact, um, all the way to the point that when the AA decided to begin its tropical architecture program which wasn't instigated by Fry, but was inst instigated by, by um, someone else. His name is there, but I forget. Um, anyway, um, uh, Fry was invited and did, did, was the inaugural um, professor there for the first three years of its existence. And um, probably many of you know architects that have studied there. The tropical architecture uh, program at the AA was probably one of the most famous um, programs of its type in the world and spurned many other schools. There were schools that opened in Africa as well that were sort of sub, not subsidiaries but in, influenced by, by the teaching methodology that went on there. Um, and many, many architects from England as well as from the third world studied there. So back to Le Corbusier just for a second as a kind of uh, another point to sort of move away from. Um, Unite, which is a, a later work, after even the, 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 this publication that you just saw earlier um, um, from 1952. Here's the grid that, that um, was, uh, was shown at SIAM 7, um, which was uh, done by an architect named Candilis. Um, and so I show you these images also because both Candilis as well as Woods um, and Josic, who eventually will show up in these, who are students who are working with Le Corbusier uh, on, on the Marseille block, here are a few of them on the roof during construction. They, they are in many ways much like the Smithsons and a number of other people there. They are members of Siam near the end, but they are the ones that sort of jump ship and, and turn Siam 10 into Team 10. And so they do become significant Team 10 players. So here's some work by Candelis, Josic, and Woods, and some of their, this is them, the competition being judged by them. Um, a church that they designed in Morocco in 1952 some housing in Algeria, so we did, Algeria does get validified, minus Kobu, um, in 1954. Um, and some of the things that they're looking at are not unlike the things that you, we saw in, in um, just briefly, at least in the words that were written in, in, the, in, the, in the introduction uh, to Maxwell Fry and Jane Drew's book, um, that they were looking at these kind of things maybe in a somewhat different way than than the sort of single-minded way Le Corbusier had been. For example, the movement of air between units to keep coolness, you know, to keep, uh, keep um, the, the units cool during certain times of the year. So they were dealing with sunlight and air and things like that. And also, even though this is a jump for us today based on the fact of, you know, sort of contextual thinking, um, the idea that this building steps like this was trying to respond to the top of topography. So that the fact that the, the, out, the external, I, I know, the external uh, movement system on the building is somehow dealing with, but I mean, if you think about it, from it's from 1953. It's a it's a beginning. It's a beginning. It's somehow moving away from a rigid uh, way of thinking. And just a, la a few last images of some projects that they worked on. This actually, I show you this one because this is a a, pro a real project that they worked on. Um, uh, reconstructing a an indigenous um, uh, neighborhood uh, in Algiers, um, which ended up well, so you'll see it later. It's en ended up on a, a board that they created for one, the first Team Ten uh, conference, and just some more uh, validity, something to add some more validity to uh, the statement that I made earlier that there was experimenting going on that was went beyond. Um, was looking at what was happening in Africa as opposed to imposing on it what it believes uh, might be the right thing as Le Corbusier was. And so you can see in some of these examples of these drawings that they're, they're closely studying um, the way architecture exists in these places. And so here's 
the, the here's the this is from uh, actually this is Siam nine so it's the, or it's the beginning of team ten so it's before Siam ten but here's Allison and Peter Smithson's board which had to do with the streets and and the life of uh, of London which you know was something that had never made its way onto these boards um, in such a fashion so it was pretty radical but below that we have the one by by Kendallis Jossick and, and and Woods which also I know you can't make them out but there are all these you'll see this image in a little while all these images that have to do with indigenous architecture and how they could take and learn from that indigenous architecture. This is one of those images where they're showing, you know, sort of everyday objects used by the people in a sort of co collage with some idea of, 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 of uh, a building, a housing footprint. And then a last study of theirs uh, for Chad, for a, a, a development in Chad, where they were looking at the indigenous architecture, and then this is a proposal of, that they're making of how they could replicate certain conditions that exist within that, that, um, that proposal. And the same thing is true here. Here's an existing floor plan and how you could create something you know, uh, in a more contemporary way that would, uh, would obviously allow the same kind of living conditions. And again, down here, they're looking at the, so it goes from you know, sort of the section to the plan to the, um, the, the urban fabric and how they can create something, although this one gets a little bit more problematic. But somehow they could create something that has that same kind of nature of the, of the, 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 um, the streets and courtyards that were, were typical of these areas. Which leads me to probably the reason why I actually in, in engaged this, this study in the first place, which was how I was interested in, in fact, how architects were learning from Africa and bringing their work back to Europe. And so here's a photograph by uh, Jorn Utzen from 1947 from Morocco looking at these works that we've seen already in other people's presentations and uh, trying to understand something about the courtyard structure that, that was inherent in these. And then himself, he was invited there by family to, because he didn't have any work in 47. So at that point, he's, he made two proposals that were single sheets, one, one page. One is for housing, which we could talk about some other time, uh, in Morocco. And the other was for a textile factory, which um, if you know Utzon's work, um, you know, the sort of roofing system, the, the sort of way that he dealt with roofs and things like this are all sort of in their incubation stages in these early drawings, but also very much I think influenced by this 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 idea of going to this place. This is the beginning of I think what maybe Frampton calls what transcultural or uh, this idea of drawing from from another culture and using it within your own. And then just to show you Kingo housing, which you all know from from um, our talks earlier from Denmark, um, the, the courtyard house uh, in the Danish landscape. And then another project done by a public agency in Casablanca, um, trying to create, you know, similar kind of uh, quality to the to the fabric that pre-existed in this kind of courtyard structure, and obviously, you know, more using materials and, and uh, using contemporary materials and, um, and and other contemporary ideas. So that's that's vignette too. So you're still awake. Um, so this one's kind of a funny one. It's the best I could find, but it's if if it's wrong, I apologize. But it's meant to talk about the movement of Islam into into to North Africa. So I'll move it quickly, so I don't have to. If I'm if I'm if if it's bad, I apologize. Um, it was lack of not being able to find something else. But this is the one that fell on me, um, partly from um, uh, our, our our main inspiration in this room. Um, and this is uh, showing the, the tuba in Senegal, a place that I had absolutely no knowledge of prior to doing this, and this become quite fascinating. Um, here's the, the, the Google Earth image of, of tuba, and you can see the, the central mosque and the pek, which is the central square um, inside. You can also make out, and we'll talk more in detail, but that's not too much, about some of these axial streets that come out, and, and, um, and then you can't make them out yet because it's not far enough out, but there, there's also sort of a ring that wraps around it. Um, this whole um, enterprise, which is probably the most shocking aspect of it, is it, the mosque was finished in 92, I think, um, and the city, none of the construction of the city happened until after 1924 or 25, something like that. And, um, if I can call him Bamba, um, uh, this is uh, this is the founder. He was a, 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 a Sufi um, a cleric or teacher um, who 
spent a lot of time, and you'll see in, in a little while a map uh, on a map, a lot of time traveling off into different parts of the, the, the region to meditate and, um, and had visions of the city and um, believed that it was his mission to create the city. And, um, and so it's quite amazing that someone that was born in the late 19th century um, eventually by, by, he wrote an enormous amount. Some, some, some song I heard said that he wrote seven tons of, 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 of pages. So he wrote a lot and in so, a lot of that writing is some of the, the, the indications of how the city is to be planned. The other thing that's interesting about his life, which I guess um, this is the, the Babo, you may be able to pronounce it better than I can, but Babo, ba, Baobab. Right, baobab tree, um, which is you know a tree you find all over Africa, but is a significant tree in 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 this region, and also um, we'll we'll come back to it. But is the tree that 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 Bamba meditates under? So also in in Sufi cosmology, there's this diagram that 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 uh, describes the material world as being the sort of Euclidean. Um, Square, uh, rectangle down here, and and this this diagram itself is is showing tuba is at the at the center of it, and the tree becomes, and this is this this is this tree that 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 um that Bamba meditates under, um becomes the sort of centerpiece of that, and and as you can see the the whole uh, cosmological construct of 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 um, of the Sufi idea ideology or or our cosmology is there. And anyway, I just read this. The cosmology of the world tree. Tuba, the tree of paradise, is but one manifestation of the tree of the world, postulated by Sufi, uh, Sufi theosophists. The world tree is a cosmological construct that aims to explain the created universe and, it, and, the, and its relationship to the creator. This diagram attempts to situate the Sufi city of Tuba with, within this cosmology, but it can only begin to approximate the spatial relationships involved. Space in the imagined realm of the Malakut, the spiritual realm, is not confined within the Euclidean grid of this diagram. So this is so here's the, the theoretical grid, or the theoretical construct that it's created within, and here's the physical reality. So it begins with this grid plan, which is related to, I'll move to the next one because we have another thing to read. Um, the design, it has this distinctive design characterized by the co-joining of elements of the square and the circle. The square element consists of a grid more or less aligned to the, again, Quiba, yeah, which is obviously the relationship to Mecca. <laughs> it signifies Muslim space where earthbound quotidian daily acts are aligned with the straight path of Islam. The circular element, which consists of radiating avenues and encircling roads, acts as a ver vertical dimension to the, device, to the design. It signifies Tuba as a, thanks, uh, as a place of transcendence where life on earth connects to the over, overarching cosmological reality represented by the, the world tree. The centrality of the great mosque in the, in the center and the lampfall, which is the, the name of the tallest minaret, um, which we'll come to in a little while, as this vertical marker of these two coexisting um, uh, geometries. So anyway, this is a, a bit backwards, but th this, is a, a, this is the map of, of, of Bamba's travels. So he actually was born um, somewhere in Mabak, or Mabake down here, and traveled in, in this region um, meditating and, and, and uh, having these transcendental experiences. And um, in reading about it, it was almost, there was almost this sort of images of life of Brian, that he couldn't get away from people, that the people were chasing him wherever he went, um, and that he kept trying to find uh, a place to be alone, and so he he did find this place, and I guess Tuba was the place where he had this 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 transcendental uh, experience of 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 this great city. But also, there's another interesting aspect of his life, and that was that he had he then went into exile. The, the the French found some of his thinking too dangerous, so he went into to to exile, which. Um, was perfect for him because he felt this exile was exactly what needed to happen for him to be able to carry forth this idea of building this great new city. So anyway, here's the, the center of the city, as you, and we'll see the mosque in a little while. And if, when you, if, you, if you see this plan first and you don't see how new the mosque is or how recently it was constructed, it's kind of shocking. But here's the center of the city, so this is the peck or the, the, the pank or the, the central square of the main part of the city. It's connected with the cemetery, which is also considered a, a, a space of transcendence. 
Um, and it also has a number of other um, uh, uh, significant buildings around it. Um, every year, the, there are two dates where there are, are pilgrimages to, to this space. And two million people, it's interesting, go to YouTube. They have all these pictures of people in cars and buses and vans on their way there. But two million people go to this. And also, um, once a, uh, twice a year, women are allowed to go, which is also kind of interesting. Um, here's an aerial photograph of the mosque. And you can see the, the square scale, the sc scale of the square is in, in some relationship to the, to the quantity of people that do arrive for this event. And this is just a sketch that was in a book I found of this tree, and it, it's, which is absolutely, unfortunately, is no longer there, but it's actually right at the, at the edge of the cemetery. And it had a significance that people actually would go there and carve their names in the tree, which, invent, which un, unfortunately probably killed the tree, as, as from what I read. Um, because that by, by making connection with this tree, they were making connection with the divine world. So here it is. I was going to put it in black and white, but I decided no. <laughs> but anyway. This is the lamp fall, and it comes from two different words. Lamp, which is from the French word, which obviously means illumination. And, uh, and, and fall had something to do with the name of a follower. Not that he fell, but was a follower of his. So um, it also signifies um, the place where, where, where Bamba had this, this, um, this vision, and also signifies the relationship to his mausoleum. It also can be seen from, according to readings 15 kilometers away from the city on a clear day. Um, this is the entrance into the, into the mosque and Bamba's um, mausoleum. And another image of the lamp fall. Again, sort of the symbolic architecture, ar architectural tree. And uh, the other thing I found interesting is it, it was I found a number of images of the building not in construction but in reconstruction and made me think of Gothic cathedrals and other forms of architecture that are never complete that are always in a state of transition or transformation. So just the last couple images of the inside of the and just a, one, a few last words um, because I think these these you, you you only know about the mosque. What about the city? That, that was my big question. So here you can see that that ring road. But Tuba's urban uh, mandala design results from the city being laid out as a concentric grid. The square components of the configuration is determined by its direction to Mecca. Uh, and Tuba's concentric component, represents, represented by the radial arteries and the encircling roads, mark the holy city as a transcendental place, a place where the material world connects with the, with the ultimate reality. So there's, the, there's this idea of the, 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 the path in the real world and this sort of transcendental world in one. And, um, and I read also that this, this ring road, in a way, helps define or, or hold together this idea of, of, of the city. Um, and then the question is, so what about the rest of the city? Well, the, actually, the rest of the city is constructed in such a way that it's there, each neighborhood is a mini component of Tuba itself. So you have this public square and a mosque. Um, and you'll see some images of that. And the way that the that that it worked, it, you don't go to a real estate agent to find your 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 flat there. But it was organized in the sense that that Bamba gave um, the first pieces of land to his sons, who his sons who were both also teachers and had followers, and so their groups lived within that, and they passed on other pieces of land. So all of the neighborhoods are not just organized in terms of you know people. Gathering there, but they're both they belong to to a teacher and and uh, and yeah that the teacher forms the sort of center of their community. So here's one example of of one of those neighborhoods with the with that central square, and just another example here. And here's some images of what some of these places look like within the within the city itself with the, with these trees. And then I think I've already said this, but the last couple images are really about um, the aspect that, oh, this one is, let me just go back a second. This one's kind of interesting. This limit of special status has to do with the actual political economic uh, reality of the city. It's, it's not, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's hierarchically organized by the clerics, but it's not a political system. And, and so um, 
everything is done through a sort of series of, of, of I don't know what, what the correct term would be, but sort of pecking orders in terms of who makes decisions about what. Um, but we, they have complete control over the center of the city in, in, in terms of the Senegalese government. They, they, there's, they deal with ta whatever tax, the, the Senegalese government cannot tax them. Um, they, there's no alcohol or cigarettes or any worldly things that are allowed within that circle. But also, it's, it's, it's completely under their control. It's, it's, it's fairly unheard of from, from my readings in terms of a kind of political entity. And um, this just, just to show you a kind of shocking thing, if you have never heard of the city before, that you know, in 1912 there were 300 people there. In 2002, there were almost well 421,000 people, and the, that by the projection that there'll be somewhere near a million three hundred by 2019 is kind of an extraordinary um, revelation. So here's sort of the, this issue. This is that that originating village that that Bamba was born in, and his these are the, this is the area of his 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 pilgrimages, um, and here's the city in its uh, larger format. Video removed due to copyright restrictions. When I was when I was working on this on Sunday, trying to pull it together, you know, I thought, I know, you know, this is amazing. I've this has been wonderful to learn about this place. I know nothing about. All of a sudden, I real, I, I this this image came to my mind of of Yesu Nador, who's an extraordinary musician. All of you probably know. But I went to the CD, my CD collection, and pulled this CD out. And that piece of music is called uh, Tuba. Um, City of Peace, and the rest of the album, it, which is called Egypt, strangely, I don't know quite, I can't, I haven't had time to make the connection, but the rest of the album, at least a, a third or more of the album is about Tuba and about Bamba and about this whole thing, so which, that, what that asked me to do is to sort of dig more, and so I went to sites and I realized there are huge followings in, in England, there are some in the United States, and so when these when these pilgrimages happen, which is the only good picture I could find, unless you want to go to YouTube later, um, people are coming from all over the world to, 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 to visit this place during pilgrimages, which is, I guess you can do that one next time. So anyway, that's it. Thank you for staying awake. Even, even when I only teach like, to students who just came in for the first time, they don't look this awake. <laughs>